really, really excited, man, to have you on the base space. Um, I'm the founder of Mewtwo. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Super High and Chase. Say what's up, Super. Say what's up, Chase. What up, Karen? Hey, Karen. How's it going? Hey, guys. How are you? Thanks. Yeah, very well. Thanks. Super excited to be on. And um, yeah, I love, love the platform. And let's get into it. Well, likewise, we like the game. Graphics are uh, really well. Me and Mewtwo were talking about it before, um, before the space. Yeah, we certainly put a lot of effort into into the graphics. That's for sure. Yeah. So, Kieran, uh, we always like to ask uh, when we have new guests on the space, like, how'd you get into crypto? Uh, I got into crypto when uh, my brother and I, Kane, not not uh, Aaron, the other founder in Alluvium. Uh, we he he asked me to join a business that he started, which we actually turned into the first over the counter. Uh, Bitcoin exchange in in Australia. And so that gave me a bunch of exposure to Bitcoin companies that were trying to break into the market and and centralized exchanges and stuff like that. And then just naturally the progression from there was to, <laughs> for I have a very, very high appetite for risk. So I started searching altcoins. Then I got into trading Ethereum and, and a bunch of other I think economy was was in there as well, and um, I put quite a substantial amount of, of money into it. I was a huge believer. I thought, you know, Ethereum's going to pop off and and be you know the next big thing. People can actually build on top of it. And uh, unfortunately, it was just a little bit too in its infancy at that time, and I ended up losing money, which sort of made me think twice about the space and and i ended up leaving it kane ended up staying in it um and then subsequently he created uh, haven which which turned into synthetics i went off and and was working in another startup that i created and then um it wasn't until about midway through last year or early last year kane was basically like dude you just got to get back into the space i know you got burnt but you know it's it's popping off now and uh and so yeah i just i started investing again i got into yield farming and uh and then i found games like decentraland and and axie and i just i i thought that there was so much promise in the space and and my particular you know what i was gravitated towards the most was nfts and just basically giving ownership true ownership of assets back to players that was just too interesting to to not dive into no 100 percent. i love i love that games are bringing power back to the people and i think that that's you know what crypto is really all about even even outside of games yeah, exactly. Hundred percent. You know, it's it, it happened in in decentralized finance the you know last year, and and we saw tremendous growth in in that sector. And I think you know a lot of people back three to six months ago were saying, "Oh, NFT, it's it's you know it's a bubble and whatever." But I think everything sort of starts like that, where there's just so much hype that it just is unsustainable. And then as the hype slowly trickles off, you you'll you see the the diamonds in, in the rough appear and, and the sustainable projects will will always build through those those hype cycles. And um, yeah, it's really exciting to, to see, you know, a bunch of games that are that are on the same path as us and, and games like Axie who are already leading the way. It's it's truly motivating. It's you know, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, hundred percent. We actually had Jiho um, on the space before they popped off, and I so regret not buying any of their tokens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bought. I bought a whole. But I wanted to play. Like it wasn't so much an investment for me back then, but I, I, I I'm a holder of Axie. Um, I have been for a long, long time. We kind of have this sort of running feud back and forth on, on Twitter sometimes, but. At the end of the day, you know, I'm I'm super bullish in this space, and you know, I said 
many, many months ago before there was any hype in this space that I think Axie is going to, you know, pop off and, and that's why I invested in it. So, um, you know, I'm really happy for, for what's happened with them. And, and as I said, they've, they've paved the way for, for new games to, to come in and, and start competing with them. Yeah, it's, a, it's absolutely beautiful, man. I'm, I mean, not, not to jump on the whole Axie topic, but I just love that, the, the Axie houses that I'm seeing on Twitter. I love seeing people being able to afford housing for the first time, being able to switch jobs and actually do something that they love. And um, I think that this space, especially in gaming, is opening up so many new opportunities, especially for the younger generation uh, that might feel lost or might not want to work a traditional nine to five. This is like another totally different non-traditional avenue that they can take and um i think i think it's awesome i can't wait to see uh where this goes in you know five ten years yeah absolutely and i i used to make a, a a joke to my brothers very very early on and i was like it, it, Axie is going to get to a point where they start to put a dent in the gdp of some of these countries and obviously it was a, it was a little bit of a joke back then but now it's it's like genuinely happening and so it's not only is it fascinating it's it's really rewarding to see that nft gaming can can bring that to these developing nations and as i said the reason why i'm so bullish on on projects like that 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 are you know successfully achieving that is because it's the tip of the iceberg you know that i think that the concentration of of um of their project is is heavily in the philippines at the moment but if you think about that if you if you took a cookie cutter approach and, and you built out those communities across you know 50 other developing nations it's it's the same principles it's it's going to work people would rather play video games than do a, a nine to five and, and whatever it is, especially if they're making more money. So, you know, that's why you can't help but be fascinated by this space and, and just, you know, wondering how far is this going to go? Yeah, it comes in. Uh, yeah. Last thought on this, I guess is it, it, uh, it could almost be like the power of nation states is at risk. Right. And uh, these, these particular mm crypto projects can almost form their own (laughs) their own superpower you know they can have massive influence (laughs) you know if they if they can take over certain countries and the majority of their population is actually working for axie i mean who's to say that they aren't the the ruler of those of those actual physical countries (laughs) exactly it's uh it's pretty crazy and i don't think anyone really had it's it's just so early in the piece that i i don't think anyone knows just how far this may go but because you look you look at it right and traditionally i I like working in spaces where there's the the biggest amount of opportunity for growth right and when i was looking at you know do you create a DeFi protocol or do you create you know some sort of liquidity platform or uh you know or just a, an art collection with uh, with a couple of artists that I know, or do you go after the market that already has three billion people? You know, it 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 just seems like a no brainer. But the crazy thing is those those three billion people are traditionally gamers, right? They're not play to earn. That they're not play to earners, right? So the reason I bring that up is play to earners could be converting the other 4 billion people that are out there that aren't actually playing games because it is now a job for them and it is worthwhile. So it's pretty crazy. You know, it it could get to the stage where play to earn might increase the total gaming population by like 25% or something, which you're talking astronomical numbers if, if we get to that stage. Jeez, man, yeah, who, <laughs> really, who knows where this space is going? It's, it's, it's wild. It's wild. Um, I guess taking it back to uh, Alluvium, like, how'd you guys actually come up with the concept for the game? 
Um, so again, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge Pokemon fan. I was, I, I originally wanted to build something that was similar in nature, I guess, to like Pokemon and obviously not recreating, uh, when I say Pokemon, I'm not saying Pokemon. Um, there's, there's like a, there's an NFT project, um, literally called Pokemon, but I wanted to create something similar to that but with our own characters and a very simplified version of battling, basically recreating Pokemon, but you know, the, the blockchain equivalent, um, with new characters. And, um, that was fine. I was going to do that, but at, at one point I then said, you know, this is, and, and it was speaking with, uh, Von Neumann, our, our art director. At one point he threw out, he's like, Hey, let's, like do we just go triple a with this and i was like well that's a whole nother you know kettle of fish there that that we're, we're gonna have to be opening up here if we if we do and you know we thought about it and then the thing that made sense was okay if we are going to go triple a which we we agreed we're going to need to bring in our other brother and um and so you know, with, with Kane and Aaron, Kane advising us and then Aaron being involved, you know, there's, there's three of us brothers who are, who are working on this project. Um, then you've got a situation where Aaron starts putting his brain to, to work and he loves strategy games. And so, and, and so do I, to, to be fair. So he wanted to, to put a spin on it where it's super competitive, super addictive, and not just, hey, come and collect these rare monsters, you know? And, and so that's when we basically merged the two categories of an open world RPG and an auto battler. So you've got basically the best of both worlds in, in the same game, really. No, it's, it's incredible. And I mean, that's like, that's also, that was like my next question. I was, I was really wondering like how you came up, why you decided to do like a triple A title um, and go with the high quality graphics and animation. I mean, I, I kind of feel like it was the right choice. Just looking at the website, looking at the trailer, looking at the direction that the team is going in. And I think you guys are really setting the standard now in the NFT gaming space for a triple A title. So, you know, bravo to your team. I was really curious, like how much time are you guys spending uh, developing the art for the game versus the back end and like which which take actually is taking more of your efforts um it's an interesting one a lot of the a lot of the artwork so we finished uh we've just started working on concepting the set two alluvials so um a lot of the artwork has has been front loaded and on and obviously everything works in tandem but if i had to say effort wise it's it's kind of even across the board like we've we've our back end infrastructure has been built by someone who's you know john is is a veteran in in the industry and he's worked for for several huge huge um software companies where security is paramount and so i think to myself i'm like our back end is unbelievably robust you know, we're, we're utilizing cloud-based servers, so we're not going to have any issues with, with like, overload on, on the servers. And to build that type of, of infrastructure has been very complex and, and difficult. So, so there's that effort. Then you've got the Solidity side where, and I think Pedro's on this call as well, the guy works like... <laughs> I don't know, Pedro, what, like 18 hours a day, every single day since the, the first day that I, I reached out to you. And so with, with him and, and Basil and, and the other couple of uh, Solidity devs that we have in the team, they're putting in a, a shit ton of hours. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of effort that's gone into that. Um, the art side is probably where we have the heaviest amount of core contributors, I think we've got about 55 to 60 artists on the team and um and but it, you can't do one without the other you know all of these things need to be working harmoniously and i yeah like i've never been asked that question before but i would have to say it's pretty split 
across all three departments, like dev, uh, the blockchain engineering, and uh, and the artwork. It's yeah, it's a, a team effort. I'd actually be curious. Was there like any um, glaring like lessons learned that you weren't expecting as you ventured into this? Because I feel like you touched on, you're hitting in so many different areas and already new industry. I feel like you're you you know you guys are blazing the path. So I'd just be curious to hear if you um, have any insights to share. Yeah, uh, there was there was some lessons learned with uh, investors. Um, you know, we we have if if we were to do that again, we probably would have put more of a focus on our influencer investors. Uh, you know, we, we, we would have gone out and, and actively tried to, to get the token in the hands of a lot more people that have, you know, 100K plus followings and, and huge engagement on, on Twitter. But having said that, you know, we also had a very, very good experience with capital raising. So it's, it's kind of, you know, we've, we've got some unbelievably good VCs who, who back us and have provided us with uh, enormous amounts of support across you know, like guys like Santiago from Parify, uh, the Delphi team have, have been remarkable with, with their help. Uh, Framework has been amazing as well. Same with IOSG. And so, you know, while we would improve it, would I do it any, any like drastically differently? Probably not. But there were some lessons to be learned there because I think we could, we could definitely have extracted more value out of, uh, out of those influences, um, possibly, and it's a contentious one, but possibly listing on like doing a launch pad on Binance versus going the the fair launch route, which was uh, through Balancer. Now, again, you know, you, it's it's kind of like there's there's positives and there's negatives on both sides going with Binance would have would have meant we would have had a lot more token holders I believe at this stage just purely because of the the exposure that they give and and the amount of people that are on that platform but at the same time if you if you look at our token you know there's there's some some projects that choose to do a launch pad on Binance and they go up in in value tremendously but then they come back down very, very quickly as well. And so then you're left with this, you know, like 50, 60, 70% of holders in this limbo stage where they're waiting for the, the token price to go back up, you know, and, and eventually, you know, if it's a good project, it'll get there, but you've fostered this starting price, which just doesn't sit well with the community. Whereas in our case, the majority of people bought at like 40, 50 bucks. And, you know, we're now sitting at $200 or maybe just under or whatever, something around there. So every single person in our community for a a large portion of time that they've been in there has been in the green, which just keeps it, you know, uh, it just keeps the environment much, uh, much more positive. So again, yeah, like there's lessons in, in everything, I think, but there's nothing that I would point out and say like we flat out wouldn't do that or nothing that I can think of off the top of my head. <clears throat> uh, wrapping it back to, uh, or not even wrapping it back, but just moving on to a, a different topic. Um, on the gameplay, for someone who hasn't interacted with Luvium, could you explain what an alluvial is? Sure. So an alluvial is uh, an NFT. It's the the one of 150 that we've created. Um, there there may be uh, an extra one, like similar to a Mewtwo, which you would obviously be interested in. But um, but at this stage, they're they're one of uh, there's 150 of them. They're basically the creatures that that roam around the world. Uh, the the world is is made up of it's a super vast it's a it's a huge space that you need to explore the your human character or not your 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 um, your main character which you 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 go around the world in has got like 
uh, a jet pack and um, gravity boots and, and stuff like that. So you can uh, you can explore to some of the crazy you know places that, that we built in it. But basically seven regions, uh, you know, they, they go up in, in different tiers. So the higher the, the region, the higher the alluvials. Um, they go from tier one, at, well, tier zero for our free to play version, uh, right up to tier five, which is like your your squizzes and your ramfires, and um, and yeah, very similar to, to Pokemon. They're the they're the things that you want to be collecting. Sweet, uh, that's super interesting. Uh, so I also had another question. Is Alluvium a multi-world game? Like you could go through, say, World A, and then later on, on the roadmap, even uh, go into another dimension or another world and explore that and have new creatures. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first thing is to keep Alluvium to to keep an auto battler uh, the the hype behind an auto battle going right you need to continue to either introduce new new things that that can change up the strategy or introduce literally new characters and so the first thing is that we our plan is to create multiple sets of alluvials Mm -hmm. as we go along um and they might not be you know set one is 150 set two might be 50 we that's that's all unconfirmed so, so that's the first thing. And then additionally to that, absolutely. You know, we've, we've got, um, firstly, everything is governed by the council, right? So, so we will, as, as Alluvium Labs, the, the studio, we'll put forward what we think is the next best title for us to release. But ultimately, that is then going to be decided by the council. But the idea is that it's all interoperable in that, all of our characters are going to be either utilized or, or either all or some, but always playable across the metaverse that, that we're creating. And then even additionally to that, we want to have, you know, I made a, I made a joke early on, like six months ago or whatever, that one day maybe we set up uh, some kind of arena where you're all of a sudden battling your Axie versus an alluvial. You know, something like that is is definitely possible as well. But the key there is everything is decided in our protocol by our governance council. Yeah, that's uh, super interesting. And say you guys did go with it. I mean, that's just another storyline for the the player to follow, right? So, like, you've completed storyline A. Now go complete storyline B, C, D, E, F, G. Kind of just adds a, a grind mode to the game. Um, could you explain the Aluvidex? Is it kind of like the Pokedex from Pokemon? And um, will it display like certain attributes of the Alluvial? No, so it's I can I can see how that's a little bit confusing. But we went with the Aluvidex as our decentralized exchange. So the the wording can be a little bit confusing. What the Pokedex is, the equivalent is what we're calling the Aluvarari which is essentially like a, a website which which will be will host obviously um, you'll be able to go to it you'll be able to see the biology of the the different alluvials you'll be able to see the synergies the attacks the ultimates um, you know all, all of that all of the stuff about the alluvial you'll find there but the alluvidex is is essentially just our decentralized exchange for um, trading the the NFTs in the game, so like the weapons, the alluvials, the shards, all that kind of stuff. Ah, oh, gotcha. Yeah, when I saw that, I was like, I wonder if they're gonna have like that big wheel. I don't know if you remember back on. Uh, I can't remember if it was Sapphire and Emerald and Ruby, but it had just had like the big wheel that you would spin uh, to check all the Pokemon. But anyways, how will the? Uh... Yeah, no, it's it's similar. Yeah, that's the alluvial. Okay, cool. Oh, I'm excited to see that. Because I think uh, just that part is super cool to to see if you if you or like a true OG Pokemon player, you try to collect every Pokemon, obviously. So, 100%. yeah, so I love the yeah. grind aspect of games like that. Um, 
I you did mention like fighting an Axie, but I was actually just curious on how the PvP will work from alluvial to alluvial. Yep. So essentially, um, each each alluvial has a class and its own synergy and affinity, and so you basically you want to build up the strongest team possible to when when you're facing in the pvp arena and there's two arenas that you can go into there's a ranked arena where essentially so so as you're going through the overworld and and you're in the pve battles your alluvials will actually go up in level and so there's that grinding aspect where you're not only trying to capture all of them you're also trying to level them up to to the highest amount possible but what we what we say in the in the uh, ranked arena is that we'll normalize those levels so no one has an advantage in that arena. It's based purely on strategy, putting together the strongest team you possibly can, and uh, and then just battling it out with with the other guy. And obviously, you know, you you want to have counter strategies and and all of it is is based on the the different classes and affinities that the alluvials have. Then in the Leviathan arena, which which is more sort of up my alley where I just want it to be, you know, absolute no there's there's no limitations, there's no normalizing of stats or anything like that. If you have the money to go and spend 10 million bucks on the Aluvidex to, to build the perfect team, you can then take that into the Leviathan arena, come up against someone else who's done the exact same thing, and all of a sudden you're battling it out. And you can also wager ETH on that, on that battle, plus other spectators can watch that battle take place. So, for example, if... Uh, Jordan is from SNX is listening. If Jordan from SNX wanted to do like a celebrity battle with Kane, they would both be able to go into that arena. We would all be able to jump in and, and watch it unfold. And uh, obviously we would watch Jordan destroy Kane. That is so sick. All right. <laughs> Actually, led into my next question because I used to play this game uh, where I would just mainly pay, uh, PvP on there. You would have to grind some people to get spells and stuff but there was also an aspect where you could literally just buy packs to get the spell but um i think it's super cool that you have both play to win or pay to win like in the leviathan arena and then also play to Mm -hmm. win as well really just strategical mind this Um, is also uh real quick i just want to add this before we move on it's also going to be a really interesting dynamic because i feel like this is going to level up esports gaming and you're going to start seeing, you know, like orgs start to sponsor these team creations and people are, going to, you know, they're going to have their like players on the org um, and then just doing it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's that's one aspect where, our, again, Aaron is super competitive like like me and he's a, a very high level TFT player and you know, the eSports part of, of TFT and League of Legends, and, uh, you know, alongside so many other games, it's such a huge aspect. So that's that's why I'm so glad that, you know, he's he's put his, you know, GDD together because it's such a strategic game. And that's right now what the the top games are trending on, on Twitch and whatever because people literally want to see... The, the different strategies unfold then you start getting you know like metaverse um, uh, tutorials being done and and people making uh, third party sites that say these are the best combinations that you can put together for for a team it just it just makes it super competitive across the board which people love they they like that excitement yeah that's uh kind of the same vision that I have as well right like I think as humans, we have a competitive nature to us. Like we want to compete to win or we or really just compete to stay alive. I guess back in the old days. <laughs> yeah. And now it's taking it to the metaverse. So I think that's super interesting that you can grind in the metaverse and have all these um, great characters and then even win ETH for it if you're good and you're smart and have a strategy. So I think that's super interesting and I'm definitely going to uh, 
look into that. <laughs> um, awesome. The next question that I have for you is, can you explain what the synergies are and how they're used? And then uh, also elaborate on the hybrid synergy system? Yeah, so you... The... <laughs> I'm probably not the the best person to talk about this because we we often uh, oh I have a I have a game design catch up once a week and they're still playing around with uh, with the different synergies and and whatever but um, essentially the the way that it works is you want to you want to if if you combine say three fire type alluvials. Um, you you're going to make a, a stronger synergy in a inferno. Uh, it 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 basically turns them all into uh, inferno uh, affinity, which then gives you additional attack power and uh, and so on. But definitely, Aaron is is the best person to come on. He could talk to you all day. Uh, about synergies and and stuff like that but i don't want to go and i don't want to say something that is no longer uh one of the the classes or affinities or anything like that because he's uh he's keeping it pretty close to his chest at the moment no that's uh that's respectable you know if it's not done it's not done um can you explain what the affinities are and that also kind of leads into how they'll be used as a, like a three-man team or a four-man team as they're going to find a Luby. Sorry, just say that again. Oh, uh, can, you, well, that was kind of, can you explain what the affinities are and how many there are? Uh, yep. So, um, sorry, just give me one sec. I, just I, wanna, I know you said you. I oh, man, I, no, we're just going through these, but I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Um, let's jump. To, let's jump to another question, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through them all because I just want to pull it up and make sure that I'm giving you all the right info. Otherwise, Aaron's gonna kill. Yeah, me. no, that's that's fine. Um. We can come back to the gameplay. Mewtwo, do you want to go to, over to the technical information or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we could jump into like the tokenomics and like how, how that works within the game. Can you kind of talk to us about the Isle of the Token and how, it, how it's going to be used within the gaming ecosystem itself? Mm-hmm. So um, the, the way that it works is there's basically... There's two tokens. There's the ILV token, which is considered as our governance token. Uh, so if you hold that, you, you have the ability to vote in council members. Uh, the council members uh, are the ones who basically decide on IIPs and ICCPs, which are basically, in a nutshell, improvement proposals that, uh, that basically decide how we go about uh, you know, the, the next steps in, in the protocol and, and what things we decide to, to implement. Then uh, we have SILV, which is essentially like a, a synthetic ILV token. And SILV is what is used in-game. So um, how that's relevant is, is basically our, our staking program launched about a month ago. And... People, uh, stakers are able to either claim their rewards in SILV or in ILV. And if they claim in SILV, they can actually utilize that for in-game purchases. And, uh, and that is obviously pegged to the price of ILV. So if someone wants to you know, cure shards or use it as a travel fee or you know, any, any of the other in-game uh, in-game purchases, they can. Uh, the way that it actually, the the way that the the game is is set up, is all of the in-game purchases that uh, that we've discussed, like the trading fees, uh, the wagering 
uh, in the Leviathan arena, the travel fees, the shard curing, all of these aspects go into a uh, into the vault, and then periodically the vault will then buy back ILV from the from the market, either you know through Sushi Swap or or Uni, and essentially that creates this constant buying pressure on ILV, and then those ILV are then distributed proportionately to stakers in the protocol. So we're essentially giving 100% of revenues back to the players and, and the investors. Yeah, that, that's absolutely incredible. I love, I love that concept of bringing uh, the profit back to the players and engaging the community in that way. Um, I'm curious, like, how, does, how does your company itself then make profit? Yeah, we uh, we get asked that a lot. So uh, the treasury is holding, I think, roughly twelve uh, percent of of the tokens. So um, you know that that revenue percentage is is going back into the vault. the The key thing there, though, is that that vault is governed by the token holders. So again, it's it, it's there's no centralized entity that is receiving that how it works though when and, and and how we set it out is obviously we've got a team of like 100 people we need to to have a constant revenue stream where we can pay them and so the governance side of it gives pass to to us to be able to spend that money on on things like marketing and and uh uh whatever you know operational costs that that might come up and and staffing and and stuff like that so is the council itself actually like voting for the company salaries is that is that what you're saying no so so obviously to to set it up fully decentralized from from the beginning we had to have some parameters that that were set right like People knew what game we were building. The- theoretically, someone if we if if uh, the council decided right now, if someone wrote up a, an IIP and, and decided, hey, I think Alluvium, the idea of an open world RPG and an auto battler is terrible. I actually think a dungeon crawler is going to be better. Stop everything and flip to that. Theoretically, we would have to do that. You know. Because the the community wants that, the the delegates of the council, the, the the you know they they are there to make those decisions. But because we've set out with okay, this is this is the basis of Alluvium, and this is what we believe is is the best path forward. That included in that is the operations, and and so we have a little bit of flexibility in that where the council isn't voting on literally every single thing that, that, that comes up, you know, like, can we spend 2000 bucks on hiring that influencer or, or whatever it might be, or, you know, can we sign up to this subscription service, which is a hundred dollars a month. It just gets too tedious. So there's, there's this acceptance of, I guess, what we were going to build in the first place. And then there's this this overlayer, which is the ability for the council to improve on anything that we have come up with, if that makes sense. Yeah, that that does make sense. Um, I am curious, and like how how do community members go about submitting proposals um, to the council, and how do you how do you decide like what proposals actually move through for voting? Yeah, so it's it's fairly democratic. So anyone who holds a ILV token is is able to do it, uh, as as in uh, propose uh, an improvement. How that then is is voted on is is basically so if if it gets enough traction, what we say to to weed out the potentially crazy ideas and or, or you know uh, bad ideas or 
or whatever is we have a, a governance section in our discord which is completely open and transparent and uh so if if something in there is getting enough traction then we'll say to that person hey you know we we think you know it's it's good to go in in terms of uh you know writing up an iip and then they can do that the way that it works then is is the council will vote on that but each epoch the the council is is re-elected so and and that they're, they're re-elected by the token holders themselves so they they essentially act as delegates of the community and so that's how you know we we keep things rolling along and and yeah we've had i think seven IIPs that have that have been written up now and some are super drastic and others are, are smaller improvements but you know nothing is is uh out of the question basically okay yeah that that makes a lot of sense i mean you it definitely sounds like you guys still have you know some influence and some uh some control over the process but uh the community is definitely still heavily involved in the voting and kind of the direction of of the project uh it makes a lot of sense from like a business business perspective mm -hmm. um i'm also curious if you could touch on the partnership with immutable x uh, and how mm -hmm. and how that fits into alluvium sure so we when we first started looking at it layer two solutions were not very prevalent like they're just they just synthetics had been talking about going to optimism um obviously a lot of people had, had brought up the the issues with uh, you know gas prices and 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 stuff like that and so when we were looking at how many times we need to to write things on chain in alluvium it it just wasn't going to work and so we started looking it, it, as in it wasn't going to work on on uh, on layer one on mainnet so we started looking at uh, other options that were out there and immutable uh immutable came to light and we we started chatting to those guys and they they basically solve all of the issues that uh that that we were going to come up against and you know one of them is is transaction times They've got sub second transaction times, which means, you know, when you're when you're in a battle or when you're collecting an alluvial, if you think about it on on layer one, you could if in, unless you're paying an exorbitant gas price, then you've got the, the there's the chance that it's the network's going to be congested and you're waiting like 10, 15, 20 minutes for your transaction to go through, which turns into a fairly lackluster experience for the uh, for the for the end user you know and so um they fix that there's there's no uh, gas prices at all transactions super super fast and there's also no minting fees either so we basically we wanted to replicate what does a mainstream or what is a mainstream user used to and how can we replicate that on blockchain and that's basically what Immutable allows us to do. Yeah, that's that's really, really cool. Um, yeah, I love that you guys are prioritizing the user experience um, and, and keeping that top of mind when, when building out a blockchain-based game. I think that that's super important. It could be a really good lesson for, for other games that are popping up in the space. Um, I definitely played some myself that are quite slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I was also curious. We have a lot of Link Marines that are huge fans in this space. I was curious if you could kind of ch touch on the Chainlink partnership um, and how you are using mm -hmm. the the VRF. Yeah, so it's interesting. I'm I'm uh, discussing it next week, I believe, or, or maybe the week after at the Chainlink conference. But um, we're actually using their VRF for. Uh, Something that it's, it's not being utilized yet. It's in the process of, of being built. Um, 
basically what it what it is it's a random distributor so what we what we want to be able to do is say if someone's staking in our protocol we've got a bunch of um in-game emotes that we want to start as like a, a bonus we want to be able to start distributing these emotes to people for for staking obviously there's still rewards attached to to staking but we want to go over and above and so that's when we're going to utilize the the vrf from Chainlink, and it's currently being built at the moment um do we still have pedro on the call no, he just dropped off. But yeah, that's basically what it is. So it's gonna, it's it's it is what we're utilizing to be able to randomly distribute NFTs in our staking contract. Got it. So it's to kind of prove out the legitimacy of distributing um, yeah. items and and uh, player player uh, you know collectibles and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Kieran, do you want to go back to the uh, the gameplay questions and finish those up? Yeah, I was trying. I was trying to get Aaron on just in case uh, something has changed, but I'm happy to go through it. So essentially, uh, the well, the the base classes are water, earth, fire, nature, and uh, air, and uh, and when you combine two of them. If you combine two waters, then you get a maelstrom. If you combine a water and an earth, you get mud. If you, say, combine nature and nature, you get overgrowth. And the idea is that you, you start with uh, you know, a, a base class, which is effective against another class. And then once you start adding the, the two alluvials together in the same team, then you start getting these, these uh, affinities that make things, uh, make your team much, much stronger. I see. So it's even your team building is going to have to be strategic. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Have you ever played, um, have you ever played TFT or Dota Underlord? Uh, I've played like two games of Dota. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> It's very, very similar to that. Um, obviously, we could, I, as I said, it's, it's much, much better explained uh, from, from Aaron. But at a base level, you're, you're basically trying to build up a, a, a team uh, that, and, and obviously, you know, mud, adding a, a having a, a water and, a, and an earth and, and having a, a mud alluvial might be strong against a certain type of alluvia or, or, or two or three certain types. But if your opponent then decides to put in, say, a, a frost alluvial, then, uh, you know, you can, you can start to, to get in trouble in terms of the, the effect. Yeah, that's going to be super interesting to see how people combat each other. Um, so that kind of leads into my next question. Are there going to be clans? So maybe... <laughs> Somebody can make a clan of all fire alluvials, and that's just an idea. But there's nothing that, that, that we're not officially going to have clans, but we we assume that they're going to pop up over time. Um, yeah, I I think it's 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 fairly natural that um, you know I was talking about those third party sites and whatever. I I, I think that they definitely will pop up. But um, but yeah, nothing official from from us yet on that. Uh, switch switching gears here a little bit to kind of talk about the future. Um, what are some of the developments that you're most excited about for the rest of this year for Alluvium? Sorry, what what was the question again? Yeah, sorry if I'm cutting out. I keep losing connection. Um, no, so do I <laughs> for some reason. Hey, Twitter Spaces. Um, what what developments are you most excited about for the rest of this year that you guys have in the works? Oh, the, so well and truly the game demo. I think we've put out a lot of stuff that sh it showcases our artwork, and you know we've we've put out the cinematic uh, gameplay trailer, and and a lot of people were like, but that's not the in-game 
art and it's like yeah that actually is that's coming straight out of unreal engine that's what what you're seeing is 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 what you're going to get in the game but it it really didn't show the gameplay it didn't show people uh, you know how they're choosing their teams how they're actually putting it out on the board where they're positioning it um, you know, showing the, the different classes and affinities and how they work together and how some teams can be stronger than others. None of that has really been shown yet. And we're don't really want to put timelines on it, but I would say within definitely within the next month, this, uh, this game play demo is going to come out. And I really think that that's going to solidify it for a lot of people and uh and make it real you know because you can hype people up as much as you want but until they're playing it it's it's a different story so that's um that's the next milestone that that we're trying to get to then um obviously open beta is is a huge one we're trying to get that out by the end of the year um and then as well one thing that i'm really really excited about that has has just started to be uh discussed by the council and uh aaron is writing up a gdd now is alluvium ground zero which is essentially a mini game and uh it's it's a mini game where we're selling land uh there's none of these details have been confirmed so it's it's you know we can talk about them but again they may change just because of the the nature of our governance uh but basically you buy land in this game and uh and you're mining resources those resources are then attached to the main game in alluvium and those resources are what you would utilize for things like curing of of shards and and stuff like that so essentially attaching a use case to land from day one and um, opening up an, another realm of, of game theory and, and strategy where you, you know, it's like, do I need to become a big landowner or am I trying to collect all the alluvials and then I'll sell those? It, it, it just opens up a, a, a bunch of new opportunities for people to, to play and earn. I, I love that. As you said that, it, I just think it's, it, you know, we're really seeing the creation of another dimension that has its own economy, where it has its own actual resources that can be kind of farmed for, for more money. Um, and it's just kind of like stacking layers on a cake, right, uh, of a way to kind of grow the mm -hmm. global economy. So going back to your point way earlier, we were talking about the rise of uh, blockchain gaming and NFT gaming and how it's going to rival some GDP of countries. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think we're far away from that. That's awesome. Uh, I don't. Yeah, agreed. Uh, agreed. I don't think this was touched on earlier. I may have missed it, but what platforms are you going to be able to access the uh, the title on? Um, PC and Mac is, is is what we're targeting. We, we definitely will release the game on mobile, whether or not, uh, what that looks like right now is, is undetermined, but it, it could potentially just be, um, the battling that, that launches on mobile first, or it could be, um, just the open open world, or we could say, let's like, we almost always do. Let's do it the hard way and, and launch it all, um, together on mobile. But PC and Mac before the end of the year and, you know, ideally sometime in 2022 for, for mobile. Gotcha. And uh, I, I know you guys have your hands full right now. And I know five years is an absolute lifetime in this industry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in your ideal uh, envisioning of, of the team and the company, like where, where do you guys see uh, Alluvium like at in five years from now? Yeah, I actually love it when people ask this question because I think a lot of people in this space, and, and certainly I was, I was, you know, going to do the exact same thing, which is just build it fast and, and you know, get it out there as, as quickly as possible and, and not really focusing on what is this going to look like long term. 
and uh, and I'm so glad that we switched away from uh, from that thought process, and and we've now moved into uh, and and when I say switched over, you know, this was a decision within the first few weeks of of, of building that we want to go AAA and AAA with with this first title means that we're going to have a, a studio of you know 200 to 300 people all around the world that are contributing to these games mm-hmm. and so we've got Aaron who's the I, I guess the main game designer but there's also uh, Ben who comes from Riot who has his own ideas of, of new games that we can come up with and also Johnny who I was talking about earlier he has a, a couple of games that, that he wants to develop as well. So for us, we're treating this like mainstream in, the, in, in that we're building a sustainable ecosystem, not only from an uh, economical standpoint, but from a team standpoint where we can actually continue to deliver not only expansions to Alluvium and, and improvements, like the the land game and, and stuff like that, but literally brand new titles that will also be governed by the ILV token, and probably more importantly, will also benefit from all of the the revenue that comes from the different titles that that we create. It all funnels back into one vault that gets then redistributed back to those stakeholders. So. Theoretically, it should just keep on building, uh, you know, year after year after year. Yeah, and do you, do you kind of see it being a uh, a verticalized approach to where each iteration or each kind of new uh, title, you'll kind of have that interoperability from the <laughs> the the older titles, if you will, of certain in-game items or NFTs. Yeah, definitely. I, I that's the beautiful thing about nfts is the the interoperable ability of them means that we can integrate the you know genesis one alluvials that might not have been seen in alluvium for years and years and years but then all of a sudden you can take if you if you own one of those you can play it in this new game that might be, I don't know, like a, a dungeon crawler or a first person shooter or any, any type of game that, that we create, we have that ability to, to cross pollinate the, the assets, which I think is, is super cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think that the, the Genesis alluvials as we transition into uh, from this like 2d gaming landscape to immersive VR world, it's going to be like that ready player one moment. Um, and there's going to be like the really extremely valuable in-game items. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, any, uh, it's like anything, right? If, if this ends up being anywhere near as, as, as big as what we're hoping for and we end up getting millions of players, the original sets uh, are, are, are obviously not built for, for that kind of scale. So there's there's going to be a situation where they become obscenely rare. And if we don't allow people to to be able to capture them again for like forever, and, and again, this can potentially change if, if the council decides, hey, no, we should have some sort of a sprinkling of, of Genesis one still in the, in the overworld and whatever. But if we don't, and we literally say this is the last time ever, and then we also allow people the, the utility of being able to use that Genesis one in, in our second title or third title. And then if you do have that, it's potentially more powerful in, in that certain game. It, it just opens up the opportunities for these first characters and weapons and, and drones and stuff like that, that potentially have, you know, enormous value. Yeah. Kind of going off that, um, this might be a little bit more of like a technical question, but are there any plans or is there kind of a uh, parallel opportunity to where you guys could also launch in, in the VR and have, is there anything in the roadmap for that? 
there's nothing in uh, there's there's nothing on the roadmap yet. Like we, <laughs> a, a typical AAA takes you know three four years to to build, and so we're already biting off a lot to a lot more than <laughs> we can chew um, as it is, and hence us trying to grow our team as as large as possible and as quickly as possible. So there's nothing on the roadmap officially. However, we've got a couple of people in the team who have worked on uh, AAA projects previously that had a, a, a big VR and, and AR um, experience. So it's it, I'm, I'm definitely not ruling it out, and, and it's probably on the cards, but we, we certainly have, uh, you know, mobile is, is way more of a focus, uh, firstly. Gotcha. Yeah. Now my, my gears are turning. I'm thinking of, uh, we had Boom <laughs> space on, um, and geospatial data and they were talking about how like that could be used in the future for kind of, uh, geo hashing. You, you remember like Pokemon go. Um, mm-hmm. and so it's almost, yep. I can almost see the parallels for, um, your games where you could have even in game, uh, arenas based off geo hashing and you could kind of use the geospatial location and smart contracts and, it, it, opportunities are endless, but anyways, hundred uh, percent, totally, totally agree. I think I'm gonna pass over to Mewtwo. Uh, Mewtwo, did you want to open it up to uh, the community questions if we have time? Yeah, uh, Karen, just want to be conscious of your time. How are you looking on time? Um, good point. Let me uh, let me check that. I think I'm okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got. Uh, I've got uh, twelve thirty, so I've got like another ten minutes or so. Okay, cool. We uh, we generally open it up. We'll open it up now. We'll we'll let people on uh, one at a time from the audience. Uh, you guys can request. Okay, cool. We got some people. Get them in here. People attend. How's it going, man? Hey, Karen, how's it going? Um, really excited for this game to come out. I'm a big fan of everything that you just said. I was wondering, do you guys have, like, the equivalent of a Pikachu, like a really cute alluvial or something <laughs> along those lines? Yeah, so there's a there's a bunch of memes going around uh, for one character, which actually was uh, ideated by a, a, one of my best friends. And um, his name is Squiz, or its name is, is Squiz. And uh, it's this super – there's no way for me to flash it up here in Spaces, is there? Uh, if you have a tweet of it, you can click the, op- um, the options up there of the tweet, and it'll say, say – How uh, do you spell Squiz? Squiz. Google it. Uh, Z. I don't know if it's uh, if you'll find it by googling it, but you'll definitely find it in our in our Discord. But you know, there's Squiz Gang, Squiz, uh, the the Squiz cults are, are popping up everywhere, and um, yeah, I it's it's one of my favorite characters. Whether or not it'll turn into the Pikachu equivalent, I I just I don't know. I think there was a back in po- Pokemon days, I think Pikachu got popular when you had to you had to choose a Pikachu first in like the yellow version of the Game Boy game, but don't quote me on that. I just that's what that's what I'm remembering. So um I think there were reasons why Pikachu out of the other hundred and fifty one Pokemons in Genesis became popular. And it was because so many people had been exposed to it. Whereas if you just come across like a, a, a Doug trio or whatever in the, in the world, it's kind of not as relevant. So um, it will be a little bit open because obviously, you know, there's, there's no, you don't start with an alluvial. You have to go out and everyone starts with the, the same fair launch and you've got to go and capture them. And so I think it'll, come down to cuteness um you know obviously likability and then also probably which one you caught first might have something to do with it but yeah i'm I'm not sure which one is going to come out and and be our pikachu thanks appreciate it 
No worries. Thanks for coming on, Lieutenant. Appreciate you, man. We uh, any of the any of the requests from the audience? Feel free to request. Let you on. Give it a second. I think that's it. Uh super. Oh, yeah. Wait, we got one more. Or we, we got one. Is there any way we could get some early beta codes? <laughs> yeah, we want that. <laughs> I want to try this. Um, it's one. It's actually one thing that uh, that I've been wanting Aaron to come up with for a long, long time. We've we've got this channel in Discord, which is a. Uh, it's called uh, what is it? It's like beta request or something like that, and it's becoming this meme because every single person that joins our Discord tries to to request beta access, but it actually does nothing. And so we don't have an official beta program set up yet. Aaron has a, an idea in his head of of how he wants it to work, but. Uh, yeah, right. Right now, there's, there's. I, I don't even. Even if I had beta codes to give you, um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to. That's all good. Hey, you, it never hurts to ask. I've actually just got Aaron, um, who's responded to me, so I might be able to get him to quickly jump on just to go through some of the more in-depth gameplay questions that you guys have would that would that be uh valuable to you guys yeah that'd be cool yeah yeah give me one sec let me let me get him in he's he (laughs) he did like 24 hours straight last night we tend to (laughs) to work retarded hours but um i'll just get him on give me one sec all about the grind yeah we also have uh requilliam here from the from the audience. Really, not the first time I've heard of that. <laughs> how do you pronounce Requiem. it? I don't know. How do you? Sp- it's like requiem, like that. Um, yeah. Music. What is requiem? What <laughs> I always see people posting about it on my Twitter and stuff. Like, what? What is it? A, a clan or what is it? That I don't know. It's just it's like an it's like an avatar of my of the other anime avatars which I've been posting around the social media, but like um. I ask. Um, I actually have a question about um, a story of. I wanted you to tell me the story of how you got the um, interview with Framework Ventures. Actually, That's uh, like... the, the, the interview or the um, like the the investment call, like what happened. The investment there? call. Yeah, no, I heard it was. Yeah, the investment call. <laughs> right. So, um, Kane. Santiago and a bunch of other advisors had uh, had been not a bunch actually it was it was probably three or four in the beginning were were giving us uh, investor introductions and uh, Kane had introduced us to you know seventy percent of them and um, right at the end of our capital raising I'd we, I'd done like forty five capital raising meetings in the space of like two and a half weeks everything was going really really well and um you know we were were just about to pick our leads and and stuff like that then i get this dm from kane and and he's like hey how are you going with the the raise is it nearly done um and i said yeah yeah it's awesome like i've never been i've never experienced this before we have like top level VCs who are wanting to, to give us money and we're sort of like working out who's going to be the lead and like how they're going to be positioned. And he was like, okay, well, I've got an issue. I forgot to intro you to framework. And I was like, okay, I don't even really know who that is. Like I've seen you talk about them. I know they're an investor of yours, but what's the deal? And he's like, they're huge. Like I'm actually going to be in trouble for not, <laughs> for not uh, giving you the intro I thought I had and so we we jump on we jump in this telegram and, and um, Vance is, and, and Michael are like what 
the fuck are you doing, Kane? Like, how could you not give us this alpha? It's literally your brother <laughs> and we're one of your largest investors. We, you know, we do so much for you. Like, how could you? And obviously it, it, it was, it was very uh, jovial and, and we we're just joking, but we then jumped on a call and most of these interviews would take probably 45 minutes on, on average for us to, for me to get my, my pitch across. But, um, <laughs> but these, the Vance and Michael, we jumped on the call and I'm like four minutes into my spiel and I'm basically like, look, you know, I'm super sorry about my brother. He, you know, he's, he's a moron sometimes and, and he's very forgetful, obviously still, still joking. And, um, and I went into my pitch and they stopped me in like four or five minutes, put me on mute. They turned to each other and they were like, you want to lead? Yep. And I'm watching. I'm obviously I, I, I can't hear them saying this. I'm just reading their lips and then they take me off mute and they're like, all right, we want to lead. And I'm like, uh, okay. So the issue with that is we're pretty much full. Like we, we don't really have any ability to do that. And they were like, well, you know, we, we want to put in, you know, at least half your round. And I was like, oh dear God, what is this space? Who are you people? And, um, and so anyway, we ended up, ended up obviously it was it was all good you know they were they're super supportive in the end they said whatever you can you can give us we we totally understand that uh that Kane has has dropped the ball on this one and it's not your fault and uh yeah so that's the that's the story of framework Amazing, man. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> really, really appreciate uh, thanks, you man. sharing Thanks, man. I appreciate it. it. it was, I heard it was like pretty funny um, experience. Yeah, I look, I mean, the whole, the, 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 I've been, I, I used, as I said early on in the call, I, I started a bunch of uh, businesses in my time. And the last one that I was running, raising capital, was like drawing blood from a stone it just basically was impossible it was a it was a food startup with with delivery and stuff and um and so i was used to basically begging <laughs> with my hands out like please sir please can i have some some pennies of your investment and then we walk into this space and it luckily the timing was perfect the ether just popped off and people were just throwing money at it like it was insane and i'm like sitting there danny my business partner who, who did the calls with me was like we'd get off the phone and we'd look at each other and we'd be like is this real like can you pinch me and i'll pinch you and we'll just both figure out if this is actually a real scenario because <laughs> it's kind of insane but i guess everything in crypto is it always is thanks for coming on requiem appreciate you brother hey um Aaron has uh, has just jumped on, and as I suspected, he's <laughs> he's pretty bloody tired. But if you want to throw, uh, if you want to uh, allow him to become a speaker, I'm sure he can just quickly go over the the classes and 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 how the affinities work for the strategy in the game. Just just quickly. <clears throat> Yeah, I just invited him to speak. Man, that's sad that ev not sad, but sad for me that everybody requests for private beta. That means nobody's getting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can actually ask Aaron about that as well because uh, I'm not. I I don't even know. That's I. I'm in the dark on that one, 100. percent He's he's got some something planned. Um. Hey, Aaron, you have to be on your mobile device. Uh, if you're not, I don't know if you can see my request. Hmm, let me ask him a question one sec. Um, yeah, they, they don't have speakers on desktop if he's listening in on his computer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if not, that's that's totally fine. I can just I DM him. Sweet. Maybe he can 
uh, jump on himself. He's, he's definitely the best person to, to go through all the, the gameplay and strategy and, and stuff like that. As you can tell, I'm, uh, I'm definitely more on the, the business side of things. Uh, here he is. How's it going, Aaron? No, there he is. Hey, guys. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Welcome to the base base. Great. So what, what was the question that you wanted me to go over? The the strategy of the game? Yeah. So just uh, kind of explain what synergies are and how they're used. And then what the <laughs> hybrid synergy system is. Okay. So synergies just mean that the more of a particular class or... Uh, affinity of a character that you play you you get a bonus so for example in in our game you have these base affinities which are water earth nature fire air and then on top of that if you play multiple of the same affinity so for example let's say you play three water characters they all get a bonus that they wouldn't get if there was only one or two of them. And if you play four of them, you get an even bigger bonus. So the, the idea is that you get rewarded for playing more of the same uh, affinity of things. So the, the, next, the next step of the question about like what is a hybrid affinity or, or a hybrid synergy, we, we don't stop there. We actually have 15 other affinities in the game and they're built off of all of the combinations of the other affinities so we have things like mud and shock and tempest which are combinations of those base ones and if you play multiple of those uh, alluvials in the battle you'll get some really powerful bonuses that build off of the base bonuses but then go even further than that and they also act as an extra unit for the base affinities as well so if you play for example a maelstrom unit that's that's a combination of water and water so you would actually get two water which means that all of your water characters get more powerful when you play a maelstrom character and then at the same time we have the classes which are identical in that there's five base ones of those and then there's another 15 hybrid ones that are combinations of the two. So, for example, we have a class called uh, Slayer, which is built out of uh, Fighter and Rogue. And so that's like obviously one of the, the highest damage output classes in the game. There's another one called Mystic, which is a combination of Empath and Empath, which means that it you... It's, it's not quite a support type character, but it's a little bit. They, they give bonuses to the team. They work better as a team, that, that sort of stuff. And so that, that sort of explains what hybrid synergies are. But the, the strategy element of the game comes from the fact that in a lot of these auto battlers, you, you're playing against a large number of people in a single match. And the, the larger the number of people that are in the match, the, the less room there is for you to outplay your opponent because you don't know who you're going to be up against next. So you end up needing to just try and come up with a, a strong board. And, and that's, that's fine, but, but we don't have that randomness where you're drawing cards out. In, in our game, you actually build a deck by going out into the world and capturing the alluvials and capturing and, and like forging and enhancements and stuff like that, building yourself up. So when, when you go into a battle, you, you've got a fixed deck, which allows you to, to do some of the options, but not all. And then you have to battle against the other person. And as they start playing their alluvials, you have to counter them. So for example, in the affinity space, if you play a fire character and your opponent plays a water character, you actually do less damage to them than what you would normally, because at least in our game, the water is going to beat the fire. But if you play fire and they play nature, you're actually going to do more damage to them. So quite similar to the way that there's uh, types in, in Pokemon. But then we also have the synergies for the classes set up in exactly the same way. So the, the way that it works is every, every affinity and every class has another affinity and class that it's really strong against. 
one that it's a little bit strong against, one that it's a little bit weak against, and one that it's very weak against. And so as you're playing, there's this, this sort of balance between the two where you want to try and beat your opponent by picking affinities that are going to allow you to do more damage, but you also want to pick classes that are going to allow you to do more damage based on uh, what they play. And, and so in the end, th there's really those two systems plus the positioning system plus also our enhancement system, which allows you to, to sort of boost up a couple of the characters that you play. Uh, when you combine those four, in isolation, they're really easy to understand. You can, you can sort of know intuitively that, you know, if you've got a, a group of empath characters and a, and a rogue that does massive spike damage comes in, those empaths are screwed, right? So, so rogue is very, very strong against empath. It, it makes very clear sense. And then fire is going to beat nature. That obviously makes a lot of sense. But you've got to strategize around playing all of those systems at the same time. So when you're learning the game, it'll be very easy for people to say, right, I understand these basic things. You know, rock beats paper, paper beats... Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, or paper beats rock. But um, you you then have to do them all together. And that combination of doing them all together is the thing that makes it very hard to master. But you'll everyone will be able to learn how to play the game within a, probably a day or so. But to become someone who's going to be excellent, you have to really, really know deeply your stuff. And then on top of that, know... The, the actual underlying alluvials, what do they do? What are their abilities? How, how are they going to work inside of this battle? And you also, you only have a certain amount of points that you get to spend on the battle. So you've got to know, you know, do I, do I go for a team that has only a few characters in it, but they're all very powerful? Or do I go for a team where I've got lots of characters, but they're a bit weaker? So th there's a lot of individual systems but each of those individual systems is very easy to understand. And the, the real challenge of the game is going to be people being able to maximize having all of those systems running at the same time. Yeah, that adds a uh, really interesting aspect into the game because now you're going to have to not even reverse psychology your opponents, but like double reverse psychology your opponents. Because, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I love games that make you think like that. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. Thank you for your lap. Yeah. We, we, we also have one more, one more thing built in that sort of gets revealed at the end of the battle, which is that uh, you can choose one character on your board to, to boost, and it will boost both you and the, the hunter, which is the, the playable character that, that participates in the battle. And because that gets revealed at the end and, and modifies both the alluvial and the hunter it can sort of change the battle a little bit so not only are you sort of like trying to reverse psychology your opponent you're, you're also trying to lead them down a path where they think they know what you're going to do next and then you have to try and be both unpredictable but still effective and so th there's going to be some real uh, cool outplay moments in the game yeah I'm, I'm actually super excited to play this game um like I said, thank you for elaborating on that. And Kieran, thank you for elaborating on everything else that we went over. Um, I don't think that there was any more audience questions, but Chase or Mir, do you guys have anything else? I have one more, but I don't know if Kieran has time. Yeah, I got, I got, I just pushed back that call, so I got like five more minutes. All right, we'll let you, we'll let him on. Let's go. I don't know. It says connecting. These Twitter spaces. Um, <laughs> we'll try and let's find someone else. Hold on. Just, just what's been your experience? Hey, Jeremy. I, I think I'm, we're. I think we're I, losing you. I think. I think he's. I think I know up. what he's asked. I just hit hit the thumbs up if if I uh, if I get it correctly. You know. What you're asking your the experience of of building the community. I think I'll, I'll answer that. I think that's what he's what he's getting at. Jeremy and I are, are often talking in the background. Um, 
you know, he, he works for Delphi, one of one of the lead investors that, that we were speaking about earlier. Um, to be honest, it's it's been a, a an, an amazing experience. It's it's been so awesome to see the the people that have joined from day one who are still with us, who still support us. And you know, I was speaking the other day to someone and, and they said, Man, I I joined and, and this is just a friend of mine and he said I I joined the Discord and it's just crazy. Like how do you keep up with that? It's it like it's impossible. There's tens of thousands of of chats that are that are put through every single day in, in Discord. How is that even manageable? And the answer is our moderators. And and not even our moderators, like our uno- what I call our unofficial moderators. They're literally on what seems to be day and night answering questions for us and fostering this really, really positive community that is super excited for, for the game that we're about to launch. And and so watching that happen has, has probably been the most fascinating and uh, enjoyable thing to, to see in our community. Obviously, we, we do a bunch of initiatives to, to keep the to, to keep it exciting in there. We're, we're pre-launched, so there's nothing that you can play yet. So we do that by partnering up with uh, with other DeFi protocols and, and influencers. And we, we essentially have, have created this line of uh, NFTs that aren't usable in the game because again we're we're keeping it 100% uh, fair launch but it's something for the early adopters to to have the potential to to win just by being part of the the discord and i say this a lot and i harp on about it a lot but these are not playable in game but i liken them to the promo pokemon cards that they used to give out at um, like conventions and and stuff like that, those are so sought after now. Be- just because they were they were such limited release, you know, they would do, you know, a thousand cards and and that's it sort of thing. We've done we've taken a similar approach with these NFT cosplays that that we've created. In that, if you have one of these, you're never going to be able to get one again unless you buy it on the open market. And in some cases, there's like four or five of them that exist. And on top of that, these are not small protocols that, that we're partnering with. So for example, the, the Alfie chain link one is, you know, there's, there's a hundred of them that, that are floating around. And if you think about it, if we get to the point where we have tens of millions of players, the, those Alfie NFTs are, 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 are destined to to go up and i love that you have <laughs> as uh, as a main uh, title not financial advice because this is certainly not financial advice but yeah i mean if you read between the lines and and you you take the same sort of investing thesis as as i do i just can't see how they wouldn't be you know super popular No, definitely. And that's why, uh, that's one reason why I'm super excited for the project. That, and honestly, for me personally, graphics makes the game, uh, it's like a, a deal breaker for me. If the graphics aren't good, I probably won't play it. But y'all did a mm-hmm. job on the graphics. So props to you guys. You mustn't play very many crypto games then. <laughs> been- hey, 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 don't, don't. <laughs> Let's not start that again. <laughs> this is a no, we love all space. <laughs> no big. It's 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 a hard space to do good graphics. It's it, it is. There's been so many challenges for us, but uh, I I just want to say there's a there's an NFT out there that uh, Kieran <laughs> and a few of the other guys made that that I drew because they were just teasing me and no one's allowed to buy that. We need to let the price of that go to zero. And so then everyone can forget about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's talking about Wemfer, which is probably the worst drawing I've ever seen in my wow. life. But um, yeah, so <laughs> we, we decided to make a bit of a bit of <laughs> poke a bit of fun at Aaron 
and uh, we we minted the Wamper, and I think we put it at what did we put it at? You needed to spend like a thousand ETH to get a Wamper. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, we did. <laughs> yeah, but it was, um, there, there wasn't much me in that we. Let's just <laughs> be clear about that. <laughs> true. True. Brotherly <laughs> love. Yeah. But I mean, I, I'm I'm not on the project to be, you know, an artist. So it's 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 okay. We I'll let the 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 horde of experts and amazing creative people that we've got uh, working on this project do do that side of things. They seem to be handling it pretty well. Agreed. Uh, it looks like we were able to get Butcher to connect. You hear us, brother? Oh. I didn't see him. These Twitter spaces, bro. <laughs> Dude, we needed to just do... No, honestly, you can't bring people on on Spotify. Never mind. As well say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All good. I, th I think... Uh... I think it's been an okay conversation. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you both for coming on. We. Uh... Uh, I had a real quick question for Aaron. Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, Aaron, you're talking about classes. I was wondering, uh, is each class going to also have a skill tree that you level up as well? No, no. In a in a in a game like this, it needs to be fairly simple in in how the the skills work so we and they need to be balanced in a way that makes it, it it'd be it'd be close to impossible to balance it so that each part of the skill tree when it goes into the game plays differently but still is balanced and if it's not balanced then everyone's just going to go down one branch of the, the skill tree to, to win so it's not it's it's an interesting idea there's there's some issues around that that make it even harder than that just based on how we're doing it, being fully data-driven and deterministic. A, a lot of people don't realize, but, but the game that we're building, like when you, when you run it, it will always, like if the starting conditions are all exactly the same, it will always give you the exact same outcome, which means that we can run it serverless. So to store a battle in all of its high-definition glory and, and stuff like that, instead of us storing it as as like a video or a series of movements or whatever we just store it as a starting condition and that is like you know a kilobyte of information or less and then we can have every battle that's ever happened in the entire history of the game on there and, and you can go and study other opponents because we really do want this to be an, an esports title like some of the other bigger auto battlers uh, and, and it just means there needs to be a little bit more clarity about what each of the characters in the game does. So at, at the moment, there's there's no skill tree, but when we look at developing, you know, title three or four, I I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen, but you know, there there may be skill trees in Alluvium's future. Makes sense. No fun when everyone's running the same meta. That's right. Thanks, LT. Um, huge thanks to Aaron and Kirian for coming on and walking us through the project. I mean, I'm really excited. I don't know about you, Super and Chase, but this has been hella based. Yeah, we got to uh, form the <laughs> squad, the base base squad. We're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be number one, baby. We're coming. <laughs> hey, they were asking about the, the beta program. Have you, you got any more thoughts on that, Aaron? So the, the beta, the private beta is going to start small and it will originally start as just a, a few handpicked people and a lot of them, if, if I can arrange it, are going to be experts in the, the auto battler genre. So I've already reached out to a few people that are pro level uh Dota Underlords and uh, TFT players. And for the very initial conversations, I'll be 
working with them and, and a few other people. And then when we do the proper private beta, there'll be a form that you have to fill out and then you'll you'll have to be selected to come on and it'll be a staggered approach. So it'll start off small and it'll get to become bigger and bigger. And a, as we start to expand it out to more and more people in the private beta, that will get us close. Like every day we'll be pushing out new builds and that will get us closer to the the public beta, which is where we launch officially. Uh, but the reason why we're calling it a public beta is we won't have all of the assets in the game at the start. We won't have all of the regions in the game at the start. And there'll be some pretty cool features that, that we look at as really good to have, but not essential. And they'll be built out over the, the following uh, months of the start of that public beta. And then at some point we'll have all of the assets in the game and that will follow a, a story curve. I've actually got a, a new lead writer that started about four weeks ago and took over from me who was doing the majority of the story elements. And so as you, as you play the game, you might have an opportunity to discover some piece of the story or as some people know already i i don't remember leaking this information but it's somehow gotten out but uh the the players in the game will be the ones who unlock the the obelisks over time so yeah th there's a lot of cool features that could put you in the in the history books for our game pretty sure if, if pretty sure that was my bad Sorry about no, that. no, it's 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 all good. I mean, the, the <laughs> ga gameplay stuff is uh, is is totally fine. We're, we're pretty we're pretty advanced on that. So that's definitely going to be uh, a feature of the game. That that as you're as you're playing, it could be that you unlock the the next obelisk. They they all start off locked, mm -hmm. and we we have eight regions in the game but when when it starts it will be locked down to to just a few and there won't be all of the characters in the game and they'll be released over time so so yeah the the it'll be a it'll be a gradual progression and there'll be a form that you have to fill out to, to get your name on there and if you're not selected straight away don't stress too much we have uh, at least a couple of people inside of the project that are, uh, I'd, I'd say, close to Civ-like in nature. They'll be leaking out some of that footage. No, no questions <laughs> asked. So if you're not if you're not in the private beta at the start, don't don't stress too much. You'll, you'll be seeing how things work, and we we just need to because we're doing a lot of new systems on the back end. We can't just instantly put you know thousands and thousands of people into a beta we have to stress test it and we have to build it up slowly to make sure that it accommodates everyone we we do some pretty pretty cool things on the back end to to use like a, a, a semi serverless infrastructure so for us our scalability should be like really easy we should be able to scale up to millions and millions of uh, players, I, I think at some point the the scalability will be uh, more of a challenge for us and Immutable X to to work on. But we've been having some very fruitful conversations with them recently about how they're going with their scaling, and we're very confident they'll they'll be able to uh, accommodate us uh, well into the future. Does that does that answer it? Yeah, that that's that's perfect. Thank you. So just to be clear, if I put my name in the beta request channel in Discord, I am going to become a beta tester. That's right. No. <laughs> okay. <All right>. By <laughs> dreams. <No. laughs> you, you you're gonna have to <laughs> fill out a form. <laughs> okay. That's what keep, keep keep it keep in mind who actually made that beta request channel. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I, I, I made pretty much every channel in the Discord bar just a few. And <laughs> one of them just happens to be that beta request channel that somehow popped up on day one and uh, was a little bit of a, a non-consulted uh, action. But we're, we're not sure who made that. Maybe you have some uh, theories on it, Kieran? We'll have to dive 
we'll have to dive we'll, deeper into that yeah, one. We'll, we'll dive we'll dive deep into into who, who created that channel <laughs> but it's 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 been a fun ride and it's shown it for, for for better or worse the fact that there's like 19 trillion people in there that have requested is a very positive sign for us it, it shows that there are people hyped about the game and and that's positive. They, they they haven't played it yet, so you can never truly know until you've played something whether or not you're really going to enjoy it. But the fact that there's a bunch of people out there that that have a pretty clear idea of what the game is going to be like and they're, they're all in makes us feel like we're on the right track. I love that. Aaron, thanks so much for popping in last minute and Karen, thanks for thanks for coming on. We do record these. Are you guys okay with us posting the episode on YouTube? Yeah, yeah, every, sure. everything except the part where I said that uh, rock beats paper. That's not allowed to go out. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's a legal legal violation, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I, I when when they first asked me about the classes and affinities. I hadn't, uh, my internet connection wasn't strong at the back. And I was like, he cha- these things are changing all the time. So I don't want to say something and then have it be recorded and then have to have <laughs> a side conversation with you as, as to why <laughs> I said something exists when it doesn't. So if we can delete that whole section and just pop in Aaron's, that would uh, also be beneficial. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see what we could do. It's kind of funny, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, we're kidding. We're kidding. You can post whatever. It's, it's all good. We don't yeah, we, take we, ourselves we, we too don't. seriously. Yeah, no, this, we, this has been awesome. Uh, and, yeah, we definitely want to stay in touch. I think the whole team is really excited about, about the project. And, you know, you guys are really pioneers of the space, building out the first ever AAA NFT game. So, I mean, you guys are setting the standard. You guys are setting the stage. And, you know, you guys should pat yourselves on the back. I'm sure you're working a ton of hours um, on this game to, to put it out and make it fun for the community. So really appreciate you guys honestly taking two hours to come on the space and talk to us and educate the whole community on what you guys have cooking. We're excited. No worries. Thanks so much for having us on. And yeah, if you ever want to jump back on a, on a call, hopefully we can not do it on Twitter, but uh but yeah, no, it's uh, it's been super fun. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. 100%. Stay based. <laughs>